Well, I have 7 o'clock. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ed Blundell. Welcome. Welcome to the public hearing. We'll start formally in a second, but just as a brief intro, we handed out some copies of the local law we're talking, looking at amending and incorporating into our zoning law. And then up here is what you'll hear discussed as the pattern book. And you might, these are six copies that we need to get back tonight, but if anybody wants to look at this, you can take them and look at the meeting. And what we'll also be referencing is the old from the 1970s, Town, Village of Redwood, and Village of Tivoli Comprehensive Plan. It's important that you remember that this is from the 1970s, like 71, 72, in that time frame. So really, the Village of Redwood has not updated its comprehensive plan since that time frame. What's important to us at the board is that, you'll recall, the Town of Red Hook has created what they call Centers and Green Space. That's their new zoning law. For good, for our good, we are the center. And that means commerce and certain types of development are scheduled to happen here. And this board and myself, we feel we need to do certain things to make sure that that development happens properly and consistent with what the village of Red Hook wants to be, what its vision is. And we've had meetings. We set up a moratorium back in September 9th at a meeting, subject to public hearing and so forth. And we've been working hard for the past four months to beat the six-month timeline. And we're about there, but part of the routine is we have to have public comment. We have some very bright people and very considerate people, but we still need the public to give their input. And um, so tonight we handed around what would be a sign-in sheet for those that want to speak, and if people come in later, we'll let go. But we'll read some protocol, but first I'll go up on the dais and uh, open it formally. But I want everybody to have any materials they need beforehand. So if anybody wants a pattern book, um, and just so you do know, the pattern book was funded by a Greenway grant, so it's not a direct taxpayer, but it's a little president, so it's a nice product if everybody wants to look at it. Mr. Chapman, would you read that Thanks. for us? Yes, indeed. For our public hearing, what we would like to do is just kind of lay out some guidelines so that everybody, you know, understands when and where and what they can do and what they can't do and what uh, is expected. So at this point in time, um, when you're recognized by the mayor or the presiding officer, which will be it, the mayor, persons addressing the board will be asked to state their name and their address. You may not be compelled to do so, but we would just like that for our record so that we can know who spoke and, and where they're located. Unless otherwise determined by the board, the time allotted to each person is three minutes for each speaker, okay? Once everybody has spoken, all persons wishing you know, and everybody's done their thing. Anybody wishing to speak a second time may do so. Two minutes, okay? Um, comments should pertain to the subject of the public hearing, okay? Just bear that in mind, the subject of the public hearing. No member of the public is permitted to address the Village Board of Trustees during a public meeting or a public hearing unless recognized by the presiding officer or the mayor. So. We'll get to everybody. It's not a lot of people, so everybody's going to get their shots. So I just, you know, we'll get to you and through the sign in and everything here. All persons speaking will be given respect and courtesy. Nobody's going to try and talk over you. Everybody's going to get their chance. And in return, you all are expected to be respectful and courteous of the board and everybody else in here. No profane language, slanderous personal comments, boisterous conduct, booing, clapping, none of that sort of stuff. Any person speaking to the board with the consent of the mayor or the presiding officer shall address their uh, remarks to the board, not turn around and, and setting up a conversation between other people in the audience. And it, it's not a debate. It's not a debate. It's we're here to take your comments and listen to them and record them. So with that in mind, Ed, thank you. Here you go. Thanks, Jay. Yep. What we need to do is just formally open the public hearing component here now. What we have too, as I mentioned, we have the pattern book which we're looking to insert as an amendment into our current comprehensive plan. And then concurrent with that, we're also going to be opening a public hearing for what we're calling Local Law 1 2014, which would be the zoning revisions plan. And Local Law is what we've handed out to those that were interested in. Again, the pattern book's up here. So just for technicalities, I would ask for a motion to Open a public hearing now at look op for local law number one to amend the zoning law, and concurrently 
open the same public hearing time frame to amend the comprehensive plan to incorporate the pattern book. The reason we're doing this, they are interrelated, and we can explain that later in the meeting, but they, one needs the other to happen here. So uh, is there a second on that motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Folks, welcome again uh, to the public hearing. And we did take some names. And again, anybody else who wants to can speak, but we, did, we weren't sure just how many folks we would get, so we need to control a little bit here with time. First on our list is Deborah Temple. Would you like to speak, Deborah? Yes. Um, should if, I come forward? If you want to go to the oh, stand I'm there. Yeah, if you like, if you feel comfortable. Um, I think everybody can hear me. Might be for the TV people. Right? Okay. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of my father, Dominic Tiberio, and the rest of my family. We are hoping to be able to sell our property, the former IGA, and we hope to see the site being used in such a way that benefits the village, town, and the surrounding community. The current site plan moratorium represents another heavy financial burden for us, slowing down the possible sale of the property and prolonging the period of vacancy of this large North Broadway site. I believe it's time to put this behind us. I also make a plea to the board that the zoning law amendments currently in question will accommodate the needs of a pharmacy that has been positively serving this community for a long time, and that a more updated facility would give the elderly, the handicapped, and the sick an expedient way to pick up their prescriptions. My parents and family served this community for decades and it is now time to turn the property over to a responsible, community-minded business. They are ready to move forward, and so should the village. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, secondly, we have Anthony Mirando. For the record, he'll identify himself, but he is counsel to one of the corporations just mentioned. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anthony Mirando. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Cuddy and Fader, and I'm here on behalf. <coughs> excuse me. I'm here on behalf of GB Northeast Two LLC, who's a contract vendee for the former IGA site. Um, we understand that the board is proposing uh, to incorporate the pattern book that the mayor mentioned earlier in the evening uh, into the comp plan and zoning law, as well as adopt other uh, additional zoning amendments to their zoning law. Uh, on behalf of GB Northeast, we did submit a letter on January 10th uh, to this board uh, uh, providing comments on the proposed law. Uh, I won't rehash all those comments. Uh, I do have additional co copies of that letter available if any of the board members would like it. Um, but I just wanted to let the board know that I am available here tonight to discuss or have any comments or questions with respect to our letter or any uh, further information I can provide. Thank you. What I'll do as he goes back to his chair we do have a note here. We did receive via email comments, and they came FedEx on Friday, and they were distributed to the board members Thank you. Over before the weekend hit. So I think we should have the clerk let the record show that written comments were received. And who would we? Your firm is Cuddy and Feeder, and we'll say on behalf of um, GB Northeast. GB like G like George B like boy. Yeah. GB Northeast. Do you have it? I, mean, do you I have received them, I'm sorry, yeah, via okay. email on Friday, okay. and I received a UPS package this morning. Believe so, it or not, FedEx wouldn't deliver in the morning. Oh, <laughs> really? uh, so yes, it was UPS. <coughs> so we had to switch it to UPS. They received mm -hmm. an email and paper copy. Thank you. <laughs> While we're on a topic of written comments received, today we received a mandatory comment from Dutchess County Planning. It's a 239M is the typical, the, t the technical name of the form. And again, it came in midday and we scanned that and shot that off to the board members via email. It does pose a question for us, meaning we will need time to look at that. In a nutshell, they did say it's essentially a matter of local concern, but they had some comments that we will have to look at and uh, recommend that this board consider that as we talk later in the night about that. Uh, a third person signed up. They weren't sure they necessarily wanted to speak, but do you want to? Arlene Harkins. 
I didn't have any surgery, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I just wanted to say that I agree with the uh, Tiberi family that uh, we should go ahead with this project. I think that the location um, in that area down there will make this village uh, tighter with everything. Um, I also agree that it's, it's time to move on with the new zoning and everything and looking over this proposal. Some of the things were very well written and you know, very well to be respected for what we were looking for. But I just want to say that I do agree and I do think that not only the elderly but parents and children, uh, parents of children that are picking their kids up from school or whatever to go home can run through that drive through where they don't have to worry about their children in the car not being safe or whatever. And I just think it's a great opportunity for the village to proceed with this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as Jay Trapp has read, folks can have three minutes. I don't know if anybody wanted to take advantage of their two minute secondary portion. Um, anybody need more time or anything to say? That being said, we had blocked time for this. We still have time before our regular meeting. But the board, we will address it in the regular meeting. Um, I have certain conditions in my mind that I'll present to the board as far as what we'll actually do tonight. Um, the main thing being we have to technically look at timelines here. We have our zoning attorney in the audience too. For uh, these, these things are very technical and very legal as far as times and slots of time. Um, we probably make some of these decisions in our regular meeting as to what we will do next, but um, the, the concept I worked under was we needed to hear from the public. Like I said, at our onset, we had put a lot of hours, meaning a lot of hours as board, um, talking here Thursday nights, um, well into the night, trying to hash it out. We do have on our board the benefit of some professional planners who that's what they do for the day jobs and architects and so forth. And, and we have folks that have engineering and different backgrounds and <laughs> business backgrounds. And um, overall, the vision of the village is to make the right thing happen up there. And I, I think everybody will be very pleased with what we've come up with. It's a lot to ask you to read that document out there, but it was up on our website and so was the pattern book. Um, I think from my perspective, like I said it before we went into formal session, we are the center of a design plan, centers in green space, and what we're trying to characterize or build here is something right consistent with that that keeps the look of the village but attracts new business and keeps things on a roll here in the village. So there's no, no real negative outlook here. It's all positive from what I can see. That being said, there are some tactical things here, board and council. We have, like I said, we're running concurrent. The, um, Local Law 1 amendment to the Zoning Law and the Comprehensive Plan amendment. Um, it'd be a matter of choice for the board. Maybe council, you could answer, should we? I'd like to choose now to continue or close the public hearing. My thought for everybody's benefit is um, for the amendment of the Zoning Plan, I think we need, to, we need some time to get to our workshop Thursday to look at the Dutchess County Planning Department input, take the comments from the public. Um, We've had some time to look at Cuddy and Feeder's input, but I think we need to look at that too some more. We, 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 all, we all had the weekend, but uh, we need a few more days. Um, and what does it, it would start another top, uh, clock ticking would be, um, and that's I think where we have to make a tactical decision here. We can, most likely the best way would be to close one of the public hearings, meaning the amendment to zoning law, to get us to re recraft whatever wording we think we need to recraft in that. And then we could probably continue the um, pattern book one because from what I'm hearing, there wasn't a lot of comment on that uh, and it's not as crucial. I think we, the time situation is more on the zoning. Switch to round. Pardon me? Keep, keep the zoning one open and close the pattern book. Well, I think, let's discuss it, but I think the issue is we do see I do see we're going to have to 
he might have to tidy up some of the wording in the zoning amendment, which the law we have now, we would have to close and then have a second public hearing and then go with that. And again, we're not looking to delay anything here for the people, some of the speakers there. It's just, um, um, whereas the pattern book, it, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's either going in or it's not. What's your thinking, Ben? I, mean, I think we could theoretically close both, but then, I mean, it's, it's not as crucial in the pattern book. I might think he's close a pattern book and keep the zoning amendments open pending further changing that we would have to do before we do. Yeah, well, I agree because I mean, if we had no comment on this, mm -hmm. then, then I don't think you know it's at the same level of concern or scrutiny. Right, but I, I think it's counterintuitive. But I think we have to close the zoning one in order to create a new local law to. To incorporate the comments and from all parties, so we can't we can't just revise the one we have. We have to maybe council can comment here, but I think we have to shut this one down and change whatever wording we're going to change, if any, and then and then re-notice it. But it all can happen. What I'm looking at, folks, is our normal February meeting be February third. We put this one off a week because. For whatever reason, the first Monday has been hitting way early in the month, and most of our other monthly reports aren't out yet. So it would make a lot of sense to do the next one February 10th, put it off a week, give us time, and it would let us fall into all the time constraints we have to with publishing and getting the law on your desk. So it's, it's not, I think it, it is counterintuitive. I know what you're saying, and at first blush, one would think what you two just said, but maybe, Council, you want to give us some input? So if you revise the law to take into consideration some of the comments that you see from Cutting Fighter or from County Planning, it's the new version of the law that a public hearing needs to be set on. So if you close this public hearing on this version um, at your next workshop meeting, when you decide your changes, you just set the new public hearing on that local law. And oh, so there would be another public yes, hearing. Yes, there would have to be a second public hearing. It's, um, it has the same effect as continuing it, it's just cleaner because it's, you know, it's the new version. I didn't realize there would be a second one after this. Yeah, yeah it'd be February. So, so that's what I'm getting at. February 10th, we would so do what would be the advantage if, of? If the changes are minor, it's fine to continue it. But because I'm not clear, and maybe you're not clear either on how significant the changes are going to be, are you going to you know, go with them and go with county planning? It's cleaner just to close it and then set a new one once you have your new version. And so what would be the advantage of keeping the pattern book open? Um, you could close the pattern book. And that would be it. You don't have to have another public hearing on the pattern book. The advantage to keeping it open is that if someone wants to comment on it when you have the next hearing, they can. You don't need to re-notice that one if it's continued. It just continues. I think it's open. Pardon me? I mean, you know, if you want to keep them open, I don't think it's any big deal one way or another on the pattern book. So. Mm -hmm. That's my thinking, um, but it seems like technically we do have to close the uh, the zoning amendment one. You guys, yeah, think um, I think for about three reasons. One is the DC planning thing came in today at around noon. We all speed read it probably, but we need to think about it. And then the comments from the audience, and then the comments from the law firm, you know, for one of the real estate things. I think it is important for everybody to note though that this is not directly a one parcel, one customer, one business zoning law change. This is pattern book and Red Oak Village general business district work. It's not it's not directed at any one thing or one project or one person. Um, if you look at all, it's, it's, it's a broader brush than that. So, um, but that being said, uh, we gave ourselves six months and we've been pushing hard to get it done in six months. In February, we'll keep us within the six months. I would envision if we workshop it Thursday, that meeting is a pre-existing noticed meeting. We always meet the third Thursday in workshops, so we don't need to worry about a notice there. Then we would, um, I would recommend we postpone our February 3rd meeting to February 10th to give a little more time for both internal meeting and external stuff, meaning um, public hearing things and the normal day-to-day -day business we do at our meetings. So, But I would ask council, I would like to set that agenda in the regular meeting. This is more formative discussion right now. Well, um, 
you you have to continue if you're going to continue the public hearing on the pattern book mm -hmm. or the comp plan amendments, it has to be continued to a specific date and time. So you would have to decide that. Well, that my date. question is in the regular meeting session. I'm broaching the topic to the board now, but um, so I would leave it that when we open a regular meeting, we continue the pattern book public hearing until February 10th and close the zoning amendment public hearing and reset dates, but with the public hearing to occur on February 10th too. Same thing with that concurrent. And uh, the goal would be to, to vote that night too. Um, I think we've heard the comment we need from the Red Hook public. We need to look at the DC planning public and- Let's um, move forward then. With that. But I'm not sure, can we do that? Do I have to wait for the main meeting to open up? Do it right now? Okay, so the motion would be, as stated, clerk, you do with that? Can you, be, we- We're gonna keep open the pattern book. Pattern book, but with, well, we hear it again on February 10th. That's been extended to that date. And then we'll close- At seven? Seven, yeah. And we'll close the public hearing on the plan to amend the zoning law, local law one, as written tonight, we'll give us time do we have to do that in two separate motions, or we can can we do it in one motion? But it's, it's easier for records if you do it in two separate motions. Two. Okay, so the first motion would be continue the public hearing on the pattern book insertion with rehearing it on February 10th. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, then part B or motion two would be to close the public hearing of Local Law 1, which is to amend the zoning law. Um, we'll workshop it Thursday and have a second public hearing on it on February 10th. 7 o'clock. 7 p.m. Is there a second? Wait, can, can we just limit that motion right now to just closing the public hearing? and then Without resetting? Okay. Yeah, only because you shouldn't reset until we have the new okay. version. Second. So, on the vice council, we'll just say close the public hearing on amending local law, uh, amending zoning law, local law one. I heard a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so your workshop meeting is going to be this Thursday. Yeah. Okay, so we're closed. So public hearings are closed right now. Yeah. We'll probably take a water break, and then we'll do our regular meeting. Some people are here for a regular meeting. It looks like that starts in about seven minutes or so. So if you want to kill all rise and play the play. That's it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, welcome. Out of the same folks and some folks have left. We are in a new year. For the calendar, 2014, but for the village, we're still in our old fiscal year. Which we know how to clear a room. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, welcome, everybody. What we do is we just went through a public hearing on some zoning and some uh, pattern book amendments. We still have council here, which being uh, fiscally responsible, we like to get her input and get her out the door so <laughs> the meter gets turned off. It's uh, not the <laughs> We, we did the formal closing of public hearings and so forth and continuation of another, but, and you'll all recall that, but I think for the record, we just want to state it again. We, um, they're closed as described earlier, but we want to set, we do have our preset workshop meeting in 72 hours, which is what's that, the 16th, mm -hmm. Thursday. And then um, I'd like a motion to move the February 3rd monthly meeting to February 10th, and we would fold in the agreements we made before as to public hearings, meaning we would continue to hear the uh, insertion of the pattern book, and then we would look for a second public hearing on the zoning amendments. So uh, is there a second for such a thing? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. I think with that, we could dispatch the zoning council. But while we're on the subject of charging and rates and things that are dear to some of our hearts mm -hmm. in different ways. We have from our engineering firm, CTML, Robert Flores is here. I thought, Steve, if you wouldn't mind, can we jump you in to read your water report? You have that? 
handy, and then we could uh, segue into you, Robert. If you wanted to use the mic. Yeah. You okay with that, Steve? Or yeah, I'm fine with that. It's small for a moment. I can move too, right? You got it? Okay. <laughs> nice try. Uh, the monthly water report for December of uh, 2013. Uh, we pumped uh, 7 million 434 thousand gallons of water in December. Uh, that would worked out to be an air, uh, average consumption of 239 thousand gallons per day. Uh, the water plant used 55 gallons of 12.5 percent liquid hypochlorite. Uh, no new hypochlorite was ordered or delivered, with 60 gallons main, remaining in reserve. In the third week of December, a service line and associated curb valve on West Market Street was discovered to be leaking by the property owner during re renovations. A successful repair was made during the last week of December, with the entire service line curb valve assembly being replaced by the village from the corporation stop at the 8-inch main to the curb valve, and from the valve to the residence by the property owner. Two water samples were sent to the Smith Laboratory in Hyde Park, and both came back negative for uh, chloroform and other bacterial contaminants. And that is the water report. Thank you. And we did send out this month the quarterly December water bill. and. Um, with the newsletter and so forth. But Robert, while you're here, I thought one thing at our last meeting, we announced we were in the running then for the community development block grant where we had earmarked, uh, we did find a project to try to reconstitute, um, recharge, recondition wells two and eight over in our main well lot. And you'll recall at the last meeting, we had tested them for salinity, which knocked them out of the box years ago. Salinity looked okay, but the second test we did, for productivity was not that great. And um, we learned about that late in the game, that productivity was, as I recall, 15,000 gallons a day and 26,000 gallons a day, which is far below what a municipal water well should pump. And it gave us pause to say, even if it's block grant money, we probably don't necessarily want to throw money into it. Um, in the end, we ended up, we got word about a week ago, maybe two weeks now, uh, we did not get the block grant this year. We have 150000 from the year before, which is water related, but the, we got notice from the county that this year they didn't fund us for Wells 2 and 8, uh, nor did they fund any of the Northern Duchess, the town or village, town of Red Hook or village of Tivoli projects. Um, so it's, and I communicated with the, the executive saying that in a way we were, it might be better for all of us that because if Well 2 and 8, we probably would have a jumper hurdle, like what would we do if we got the money? We'd probably have had some issues with, you know, I, I don't think I would, rec none of us were ready to recommend putting that money into Wells 2 and 8, which maybe we'd have you comment on that, Robert. We are under directive from DOH, uh, Department of Health, to properly seal them if we're not going to recondition them. So I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit and a couple of things you and I were talking about. All right. It's, it's, uh Kind of we left off um, just I guess starting off with the project, right? That we call phase one of the water system improvements, which is the well field. Um, we completed the scheduled work. Uh, however, we still have approximately fifty-seven thousand dollars left in the contingency from being under budget, and that's what we were talking about. Should we use that, some of that money in combination with the block grant for wells two and eight? If we're not going to use wells two and eight, then they should be properly abandoned so that they're not a potential source of uh, Contamination for the rest of the well field. Mm -hmm. um, Does so we have a cost for the decommissioning, or just a general idea? We don't. We don't have a hard cost, but it's uh, it's in the neighborhood of about uh, five to eight grand per well. Okay. Uh, to properly close them out, and uh, one of them has a concrete vault, and the other one's just a well. Uh, they don't have to be. Uh, used to bend the ninth route, to go all the way down through where the casing is, so they properly sealed it off. To remove all the ground piping. So that's kind of a procedure that involves there. So there's a little bit of digging. It's not just uh, pour concrete down a well. So while you have the floor there, and in line with Jay's question, it would be project phase one money. Right. So um, therefore, the general contractor or the contract involved would be Trinity. That's right. So 
technically we don't have to rebid or anything like that. It's, it's we would just have them. We've been keeping them on, on hold in terms of how we want to close out the yeah. contract. So yeah. uh, there's a couple of items uh, that we should revisit. You know, uh, that might uh, close out the project in terms of uh, improving reliability and safety of the well field. Mm -hmm. We got we got to talk about. It. Yeah, that's good. So if if you were to project it's between five and eight thousand per well, so times two, we're talking ten to sixteen thousand. Right. And we have fifty-seven thousand dollars left. Right. Was the um, we had at one time talked about putting some security fencing and gates around the right. So we received the hotel, so that's still in the running. We have yeah, yeah we have proposed that uh, in our back pockets. We gotta discuss those two. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I thought we might go into executive session now, only because some of it involves public safety and so forth. So um, we do have a quote, and it's. What I'm thinking is, if you want to leave me a copy of the dollars, I remember it, but I could show the board. I don't know if you have that with you. Or, yeah, you know. I would. Okay. But we could we could talk about maybe doing a discussion on Thursday. Right? Could do that too, but I could bring them in and just give them a heads up on what we're looking at. And then, um, yeah. um, I put an executive session on our agenda tonight. If, if it'd just be a second. Um, um, but the rain just—it's it, not going to take up. Full fifty-seven thousand. So there's abandoned properly the two wells, security system uh, upgrades, and, um, and those are still not going to between the two of them not going to take up all that money. So um, anything else on your mind for uh, well three right? Well three improvements. We did that already. Okay. Yeah. So that's so the fifty-sevens above and beyond that. Okay. Maybe Brent, could you? Or Robert explain what the well three thing was. I know what it was, but oh, yeah, just so remind so well, us. Well, through, well, the other thing that's happened since last time we talked is we completed and submitted the report for the well field to the all the agencies, which is DEC, which is the state, and the state health department, and the county health department, so that we can get our, our uh, permanent flow. And the part, part of the exercise of uh, improving all the wells and doing the report is that we identified um, that there's additional flow to be had in the well field, and in particular well three, uh, there was additional, uh, the pump, the physical pump that was in the well was uh, much smaller than the, what the well could produce. So we went ahead and installed a bigger pump. So we went from uh, roughly 35 gallons a minute to 70 gallons a minute uh, pump in well three. Which is about what, 50,000 per day? Yeah, um, yeah, rough numbers, yeah. That's good. So that's already done. So fifty-seven thousand is left after that. Right. And then one other thing we were talking about was um, we now have our full, final first and final read with totally new meters. So, um, so what we want to do is reset rate to reflect and get rid of that electric surcharge that appears as a separate line item, and reset rate to take in the fact the USDA phase one money meaning the the interest, principal and interest, and then the, um, the, the set aside USDA is asking for that 25000 a year to build up a capital fund. We have gotten clarification. We always have budgeted for operations and maintenance in our water budget. They want to be sure that um, we put another twenty five grand somewhere in a, an approvable fund and uh, let that accrue, but we can use it for routine maintenance. It's not just things we built with their USDA money. It's, it can be used across the board, which is, is good. Um, but we do want to build that into our budget. And then um, where I'm headed is once Brent and Robert and I sat with calculators and different things trying to figure out how does one really build a water rate, and I'm not sure that we're fully capable of it, meaning it's it's pretty complicated. I'd like to get something that we could tweak if and when we do phase two, okay, how do you plug in the numbers and see what phase two does to a rate? Um, and we do have access to an accounting firm that did our AUD 133. They have a, a rate making team. They do it for other municipalities. Um, it's a fee-based thing. What they do is they look at our AUDs, our current rate structure, our, our different factors of our current water system. And I wonder, the question for Robert, is there a way we construe that, could construe that to be covered or paid for under something with the phase one world? 
I think it's very possible. Yeah. Uh, we just have to ask and yeah. make sure. But it, it goes along with the, you know, because we put in new float, new uh, meters, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So uh, I think it follows along there. Yeah. Yeah. That being said, I would recommend that we do that because um, it's, it's much more than just taking our current rate and saying we want to make 10% more money or 3% less money. You know, it's, I think we need to set something in a formal fashion that says, okay, here's what you need to do. You're trying to generate this much cash flow every year, but set aside money for other capital, different things, and, and pay costs that you know, for things that might break other, you know, we've been lucky, you know, knock on wood, uh, we, we, we guess right, but, you know, we, we'd like to keep the rate fair, but also have all contingencies addressed in case something goes south. So, um, the point is, this firm, I would, if, if we're talking with USDA Wednesday, right, they're coming back yeah. up, um, I'd like the board, you know, to authorize us to talk with them and see if we can get it paid for under that $57,000 left. And it's, it's about a $2,500 cost is what this firm was telling me by the time they analyze our our system, our rates, and then build a computer model for us. And then our software company would plug it in. They wouldn't do the billing. They would just give us the, the, the basis the to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Was, there, was there an estimate that nobody would look at? 2500 yeah. Um, 2500 for the, the rate? Yeah. Um, they said, yeah they, like I said, they looked, we gave them three years of old AUDs. AUDs are our governmental audits that get done each year for us. And what it lets them do is look at how water is performing over the past three years. And then they look at the new costs that we were incurring. And, um, and I think, too, you know, they would look at striations. Like, you try, we do have a rate structure where the more you use, we're trying to... Unless you pay. No, no. Well, it's, we're trying to honor efficiency and um, and they would try to build that in too like if people use less water by putting in low flush toilets or different things you know over the years it could help them save money too but anyway, that's the board saw I think it'd be a good idea to get a formal instead of us trying to crack into a rate and so how long does it take for them to produce this model I'm curious I mean I would like to have it done by the next read which is March um, so this is all pending if we get approval from RD and well I thought I think we need to do it either way. I mean, it's something where, but if we can get it out of the admin line of the RD money, um, to be not have our direct budget this year. So, um, any thoughts on it, folks? I think it's good. Mm -hmm. All right, so we can't swing wild with these numbers. You know, it's good to have something to push us in a, an yeah. appropriate direction. Yeah. All right, so we'll, we'll move forward with that. Anything else on your mind? Um, um, on the water project, yeah. but, uh, there's just a couple of, we kind of switched gears to the last year's CBG one, which is uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. the wells five and six. Mm -hmm. Last time we talked, we talked about how uh, the water samples for those wells came really high uh, iron-wise. Historical numbers were around one milligrams per liter of iron. We took a sample and came back to seven. Mm -hmm. Change. We took, we flushed it out, took more samples, and it kind of leveled off around five. But still, that's um, five times more than before. So we had a chance to um, go go back to the designer of the of the water plant, the package water plant that we've been, that we, the funding was based on. And uh, as you can imagine, it involves bigger filters and more back flushing and whatnot. Uh, the end result is that now we're looking at a, a package plant that's. Uh, in the neighborhood of two hundred twenty thousand dollars, so which is you know more than we had budgeted for. So there's a budget gap there. We need to uh, you know, think about some more. But. What? Um, let me see. Is there a way to to downsize the the plant, so to speak, to accommodate a, a lower flow or a, or a lower expected production? Well, the the drivers, the two drivers are flow rate mm -hmm. and concentration of iron that's being removed, right? So um, if you play with either one of those factors, you, you can get a smaller plant. Um, the, the flow rate, we've been kind of holding steady because that's the capacity of the existing well. We, we had a chance to test those, right? Right. And so 
if the well can pump 50 gallons a minute, you, you, you'd like to push 50 gallons a minute through. That's but, right. but maybe our pocket only lets us pump 20 gallons a minute. I don't know. So that 220 is just the package plant, and none of the related costs. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's. I only showed us some numbers a month ago. So, um, yeah, at one point we were at 160,000. Mm -hmm. We're at 220. The container has grown from a 20 foot container to a 53 foot container. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Yeah, to household equipment. This is design maps not too. So you had mentioned last time that. When this thing is up, when and if this thing is up and running, there is a chance for the iron content, the lower ones that keeps being produced, and may hit where we were originally. Right. That, there's right. It's, it's, it, if it goes back to the historical numbers of one milligrams per liter, and the flow is rate to remain the same, then basically you you've already built the plant that can treat both wells five, six, and maybe seven. Can we go in the iron ore business? <laughs> <laughs> Anything we're getting value out of it? I mean, those numbers, I think, I don't think we're prepared right now, but to me, they're placing the, the fringe of profitability or feasibility, I guess is a better word. Um, yeah. Because then there's other costs. I think you might have to brainstorm. There's another option that Block Grant would let us do, um, meaning drill well. I mean, it's those kind of numbers. You, you're getting on the fringe. Of yeah, the, the gap is growing. Yeah, it's so. a, I think, um, I'm not sure how best to do it, but can you give us, because there are the ancillary costs, there's the engineering, there's the insertion of power, there's different things. Right, get, there's, some, there's some site work, some, uh, yeah. got to fit the new well, yeah. got to put in some piping, yeah, so. that kind of thing. Overall, it's not great news, that number. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big more than when we wrote the grant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we got the max, too, on the grant. Yeah, right? yeah. I think we'd have to brainstorm a little bit. I don't think we're going to say yay or nay to anything right, right. here right now. Um, it's not, not, that's not great news. Yeah, yeah. So. But, um, back to the other thing. So. Um, how do we leave abandoning two and eight then? Is it, um, so we'll go ahead and get formal prices from Trinity, uh, and then Trinity. Uh, and, um, so we basically we've we closed out the other contract system we have. We have the electric contract, so we've, pro we've processed the final payment on that. Um, we have national meter. We've, we've processed final payment for that, except that we installed one more meter. You know, it's the first first mm -hmm. first reserve. So we'll have to process that payment. But it's essentially done. <coughs> and then, um, maybe I think we, we kind of came up with a game plan for, well, maybe after Thursday, when we determine the security improvements we might want to make. Um, we'll have a game plan for finishing out that contract, too, then. I would think we should abandon Wells 2 and 8. They've been sitting there, what, 15 years? Uh, At least, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's and just not good. It's use to us, right? That's Pardon? Yeah, they're, they're, they're of little use to us. It seems like that was, liability, really. <laughs> yeah, it seemed like, if you recall from last month's meeting, it seemed that way to me. It's, you know, we're talking about security at the well fields. It's part of it is to button them up. And it, it's, it, I mean, before we do that, is there anything that they could be used for that the village could make use of at this point? Well, they make good, they would make a good monitoring well, you know, which you would monitor well and measure the depth of water. From an image, from a source not being pumped, or you know you have you have uh, seven wells in that area, general area, and they all have level sensors. So, how much more data can you? Sure. Yeah. I would say we, it's a good question, but I don't know what else we're doing. Let's, uh, I feel better with them capped off. The DOH has told us to cap them off. It's uh. and there's mm -hmm. nothing that we can do and the production is so so light that, that it was almost 12 gallons a minute almost 18 gallons a minute so. yeah. we know it be better off if you need additional water than at that location that drill the well right yeah right out if you're gonna give, if you want to get more water you 
can. The thing to do would be to drill a new gravel well. I think it came up last month, Robert, but with the bad news on the high iron and different things at the other site, if we were to reconfigure the block grant, would you want to use the shaft of two or eight, like the 26,000 per day? Which one is that number two, I think? Could you blast or some, you know, like do something to throw um, the money? That yeah, place? it really wouldn't, it would, it would be more, um, it wouldn't benefit you for, because it doesn't meet the standards of, a, you know, a modern well. Uh -huh. And um, it, was, it was set up to drill for rock. And we want to get the gravel. Yeah, I remember you went into that a little bit last month. Now you say that. Yeah. The intricacies of the, of the so the gravel well we need a screen. And, uh, uh, and right now there's no screen. Mm -hmm. So um, and you're not digging that deep, so it might as well you know, start to pick a good spot and go. Well, USDA is after us to close the project out, so I think we might as well decide tonight one way or the other. Um, is your engineering recommendation? Set in your brain, do you have one you could give us right now? I mean, we, uh, in terms of closing the well, yeah, yeah, I, th I, don't, I think that's a pretty solid, solid decision there. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'd make a motion that we acknowledge that we tested the wells in the hope of bringing them back, but they're just not producing enough and they can't be reconditioned like the other wells were. Um, and they are a safety health exposure by leaving them the way they are. So we should comply with Dutchess County DOH rules and use the USDA contingency money that's left, or the, the surplus that's left to... Uh, you want pending a hard, a hard estimate? Yeah, hard pending, estimate. but it would still go through... Um, through the contract war on Trinity. Yeah, tr Trinity. So uh, we'll, we'll get hard numbers, obviously. On that. Yeah. Is there a second? I'll second that. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So voted. Thanks. Okay, Robert. So. I'll talk to them a little bit more about some of those security things. Okay. And um, the only other uh, I think item we talked about was cross-connection control. Right. Yeah. Yeah, could you, while you're on the floor, Steve and the rest of the board, this is the backflow prevention cross-connection. It's cinnamons for the same thing. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about what you found? Right. So, so um, this is a regulation that's been in place for a while, let's say at least, at least a decade. Uh, but the village just hasn't taken it to the next step where you basically identify um, who in the village needs to comply with what parts of that regulation and uh, basically this, uh, the businesses and homeowners you have here you know, a single fam single family residential there's nothing you know they post uh, no risk so there's nothing to be done there so, yeah, um, and then you have to Identify well who could pose a risk in terms of uh, per, uh, potentially contaminating the water supply in the event of a uh, unplanned lo uh, loss of pressure. In water. For example, a fire where you open a bunch of hydrants or a water main break where loss of pressure would cause the water that's in the building to go back into the main. Right, that's what you're trying to prevent. Um, so there's levels of protection from you know do nothing because there's no threat to put a double check valve, to put a RPC, to um, you know, prevent, prevent it for, uh, from backflow. And so the, the task is to identify who has to do what, you know? Uh, and that's, that, that's what I think where you need some guidance and somebody who's, you know, who knows what the, what the regulations are so you can say yes, you know, these dozen, they need to do back, uh, backflow preventers and these are this other, group may have to do a double check, double check valve, and then you can sign off on the rest. So you can have a, a, an actual plan and actually implement it and have a reason behind it, right? And that's kind of what we talked about. So my suggestion would be that CT Mail work with us on that. They're essentially our operator now. And we had run a list, remember we did a sampling of our assessed uh, properties and we had about 100 names, but it looks like it's less than that as far as um, when, when Robert was looking at what types of businesses and what entities have to be set with a check valve or an RPZ. Um, so I don't think it's anything that large, but I'd like to get them active on that because we started it and then with phase one we, we concentrate more on the meter side, but they do have their staffer, Brett Smith, who knows a lot of our accounts already and they know him. I think we would just pay them out of the water budget an hourly rate to go in and identify 
buildings from their knowledge of the infrastructure right now right. and then look at the law and start the process. We, we would then generate that letter. I think we even drafted it once to, to start to notify the property owners. Hey, look, yeah. according to our records, you need this. We're not sure you do have it. And for the public, what that means is we know the school has it because they give us the annual reports. And anybody who needs one by law is also supposed to give us an annual report, which then we could have our building inspector, if he gets certified, do it, or an outside firm certify it. But, um, but I think we need to move forward on it. It's like the abandoned well. It's something that needs to be done to properly operate a water system. And uh, so, so my Robert, thought would be get them active on it. Could you? From the point of, say, the letter goes out, the people who need to have, you know, this uh, backflow preventer or whatever, uh, how does the, what's the, the, the process from that point that everybody's identified and they've been notified? How, how does it move forward from that point? I, I think it'll, it'll probably be, um, you know, considering going through the list, knocking on some doors, et cetera, probably, probably in a 60-day window, I would say, we'd have, we'd have identified and then you have to send out the letters, and you have to give people time, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, whether you want to give them 60 days or 90 days, work can decide. So and it would be the property owner's responsibility to install. Right, because it, it, it's a compliance to building code and, and local codes. So typically uh, some design professional or engineer or somebody with, with a skill set like that would then tell them what they need and where it needs to go and how the installation would proceed. And you would have to sign off on it when it's installed. Right? And, and then they would notify us that it's getting ready to happen. And then they do it and they say, come inspect it. Right. OK. Yeah, I don't think CTML would not do that part. Right, yeah, right. but that. I mean, the village the would the send an inspector out yeah. to, to verify that whatever they s said that they were going to do has been done. Mm -hmm. Correctly. And we wouldn't design what they need. We would just identify who needs it, and then they would pick their professional advice. Right. We wouldn't direct them to you. We would just say you need an engineer, pick, pick who you want. The, the, one of the big, big things um, in uh, the village here that I see is going to become potentially a problem is the ones that need backflow preventers. Backflow preventers actually discharge water in the event of a low pressure event. So that water has to go somewhere. And typically, the people that have backflow preventers are larger water connections, you know, mm -hmm. one inch, two inch meters. So, uh, so potentially 50 gallons a minute being dumped in your basement, right? So, so that's that becomes the issue with uh, installing them, retrofitting them, right? That water is somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not that it's not as easy as just you know cutting the line, putting it in a valve, and done. So, why don't we authorize them to start? The knocking on door and looking at the buildings and just winnowing down. We can get you that list we developed, but I think it's far large. The list is far larger than we actually need to notify. So okay. that's what I've seen. So you guys deal with that? So, you know, make a motion that our water operator, CTML, recommence the backflow cross connection study, help us, well, not help us, but to identify those that need it and then. Advise us, and we'll take the next step after that. Sound good? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Anything else, Robert? That's it. I'll say, Miss. Any other questions? See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We'll go back to our normal stuff now. That's <laughs> right. What we we did the pledge to the flag, but we've pushed off the late charging folks there. We have um, the village board minutes to approve. We had the meeting of December 9th and then a workshop of December 18th. I've gone through them They're quite long. Uh, I've made some edits and so forth. Are there any other additions, alterations, or corrections that you would like to comment on? Hearing none, is there a motion to accept the minutes of December 9th and December 18th? So moved to accept them. Okay. I heard a second over from Darchuk. Um, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Let's see. Treasurer Cole, would you like to give us the finances? Sure. Treasurer's report. 
Account balances, general fund, $349,589.61. Water, $104,472.68. Trust and agency, $17,999.86. Materials management, $4,346.68. Petty cash, $70.74. Village green, $3,410.41. Hard Scrabble, $3,884.33. Health insurance, $2,586.49. Capital projects, $4,183.09. Expenses for the month of January. Checks will be cut tomorrow. General fund, $112,991.18. Water, $29,749.79. Trust and agency, $17,070.99. And materials management, $5,271.65. This is December's or January's bills? I said January, right? This well, they'll be cut tomorrow for this meeting. But it'll be the December bills up to January. That's also a week late, so it's a little higher. So there are some January numbers in there? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. One thought, the vouchers are here before we go to approve this. I put a tag on one. Um, we did a central station snow clearing, meaning the business center. We did after that first major storm just before the, the holiday week there. The thinking was to best help the merchants and business people get it out of the way before things froze. And we have budgeted for snow clearing in that section a few times a year. Um, and we have a, a, a blanket rate that we work with the contractor on it. He retains and hires the subs and so forth, the various truckers. And we're going to ask the treasurer, there's one in there for um, fast tracks that we think is part of the blanket. So don't cut that check tomorrow. I put it. You mean the, the Vosburg blanket? No, no, the uh, fast track piece. You're yeah. thinking it's part of fast track of Vosburg? Yeah, it's yeah. not. It is, according to what I found out today. Oh, I was told yeah. it was not. I was told it was. Okay. So hold the check mm -hmm. and then we'll. Uh, it, it, it's supposed to be a blanket, All which right. is how they did it last year. And, um, so, uh, but it's tagged. I just didn't want to check on it tomorrow. Yeah, so nice you'll see, as you're signing vouchers, you'll see it marked in the voucher general fund pack. That being said, um, lucky us, maybe in, once we get the zoning and pattern book insertion done, we can start thinking of budget again, our most <laughs> favorite subject in the world. Um, but anyway, Deal with that another day, but is there a motion to accept the treasury report? So moved. Second, is it there? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. All right, so voted. Let's see. Nobody from the police department out there. They provided all of us with a copy of the monthly police report totals for the month of December. They have here incidents 177, breaks down village of Red Hook 103, town of Red Hook 68. The village of Tivoli, can't tell if that's a four or a six. Let's see. Must be a six if I do the math. And then as far as traffic tickets, um, we have village of Red Hook 57. It includes five parking tickets. And town of Red Hook 23. Arrests, there were 20. That's 13 in the village and seven in the town. I don't really have anything to say, so we don't need to vote on that. Uh, let's see. It's, uh, looks like Mr. Trustee Trapp appears next on the list. Thank you. Relatively quiet, uh, but we're always chasing a few people here and there for little things and, and you know, their, their issues and as a board in general, we all keep our eyes open. Uh, a, somebody had some frozen pipes and water was flowing out of the front of the house mm -hmm. and central Hudson and you know, so the odds and ends things, especially this time of year, you have to be vigilant to make sure. Uh, but Village of Red Hook uh, building department for December slowed up a little bit from what it was. We were kind of getting spoiled through the mm -hmm. summer because the numbers were, were growing and some activity. There's nothing too much going on now. 
Uh, we took in $665.25, and uh, I do see here that there is a, <clears throat> a sign application that was approved for the Cancun's restaurant, which, you know, looks like it's going to be happening up here, so, so hopefully there'll be some new cuisine in the village, you mm -hmm. know, shortly here, so that, uh, and for those who are in the village proper, it's certainly walkable, and, and please avail yourself of, uh, of their food and their and their bar materials, if you will. Um, for the most part, it's uh, it's relatively simple stuff that's been going on in the building department. And uh, there were only two building permits issued in December: one CFO, one certificate of compliance, two municipal searches, no orders to remedy, no stop work, no court, no fire inspections, no complaints. Uh, Sam did conduct uh, nine inspections in and around the village for various things, uh, construction going on, insulation, framing inspections, and things like that. Uh, the planning board <coughs> did have an agenda, uh, sign approval for the Cancun's restaurant, and the CBA had no agenda, so they were uh, um, nothing to do, huh? Nothing happening. <laughs> and. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. I did want to commend Jay. He came in. We had a planning board meeting this past Thursday, a week ago, and um, in our effort to keep training, they, they do have required training hours per year, and we send them off to local training. But Jay's also working with them, as I mentioned a number of times. He and Brent both have worked in that field, um, so Jay dedicated some time that Thursday. And I got some nice feedback, Jay, from the people, some of the people out there. They said it was a lot of fun. It was a good uh, job. It was fun for me. And our goal there is to get them in tune with what the zoning code states and the philosophy and vision of the village and just make sure they realize mm -hmm. what they are capable of and that they know what they have for tools. And um, it was good. So, Jay, thanks a lot. Oh, you bet. And My pleasure. As you were speaking, I wrote down one question, which I always think of. You know how we have to do certain fire inspections every year through our building department? Mm -hmm. I haven't really seen anything that. Would you mind following up on it during the week? Um, yeah, uh, no? there, there are none now, but I mean, typically on the report, it, he does them in, in groups. You know, yeah. he'll he'll set yeah. up a number of them, and, and at times there'll be seven or eight or nine of them at one time. Yeah. He'll go out in a week and just uh, bang them out. Yeah, so, I just kind of think at the end, December being an end of the year, I thought there might be more for some reason. But I see why. Permits and signs. I'll go through my old stuff just to kind of understand the frequencies yeah. and things and okay. when the, the major spate of them comes down. So it, it is an annual inspection. So Yeah, I did talk to them, Jay, you had you had gone online to the New York State Department of State site. Oh, um, okay. But the annual report? Yeah. And, um, that office does insist that they filed and I guess to double check. So it's for some reason they It just didn't get up uh, I don't quite understand why either, but it's uh Okay. Well, if, if, if you think of it too, maybe you could double check that, but it seems like... There's an annual building department report that needs to be uploaded and sent in to New York State. And it basically uh, talks about your, your building department activity over the year. And uh, you can go online and on the, the DOS, I believe it's DOS, yeah, it you go into codes. And then you can see all the municipalities that have or have not done their annual reports, so, uh, and it just was curious to me that uh, I did not see the village nor the town of Red Hook at that point, and I, I mean, uh, we had spoken with Sam, and he showed us the, the form and said, oh, it's been sent, mm -hmm. and we were just both curious why it didn't appear, that's all. Yeah, now they're doing 2013, so, <laughs> thank you, Jay. <laughs> Maybe we'll jump, uh, Steve, we let like you talk about water, you want to talk about facilities, and then you've got, I think, on the 21st of January, is it now? And yeah, so, uh, the 21st of January at uh, 10 o'clock, we'll be uh, converting the uh, phone system, or not the system, but the, uh, we're going from Frontier to Time Warner, and that happens at 10 o'clock. Okay. There'll, be, there'll be about three of us here. Will there be a downtime on the lines? No. So downtime being momentarily. Oh, okay, fine. 
the actual works done in a database that everybody, uh, every phone company goes into. So once that change is made, traffic will reroute. Great. And then, um, let's see. Ms. Norris, yes, would you sir. like to go? Sure. Start with materials management. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for the month of December, we had 8.2 tons of single stream recycling and 13.44 tons of garbage. Uh, we paid out $1,438.08 and we sold $4,697 in tags. Um, the numbers are slightly higher than normal because there were five Mondays, five garbage days um, in December. Um, Ed and I were talking today, overall the numbers look pretty good. So keep, uh, keep buying garbage tags. So yay. Um, we're having the second annual electronic recycling event this Saturday, January 18th from 10 to 1. Um, it's going to be at the Town Recycle Yard instead of last year it was at the municipal parking lot. It's going to be at the Town Recycle Yard on Firehouse Lane. Um, allowable allowable e-waste includes televisions, monitors, computers, keyboards, small scale servers, fax machines, scanners, printers, cell phones, VCR, DVR, DVD, portable digital <coughs> music players, digital converter boxes, cable, satellite receivers, electronic or video game consoles. Um, we do have limited home pickup available if you're not able to um, lift your TV or whatever, um, Ed and some strapping people from BARD will come and pick it up. Uh, but you do need to make an appointment for that. Uh, if you're a Red Hook Village resident, please contact 758-1081. If you're a town resident, uh, it's 758-4606. Uh, this event is brought to you by the Village of Red Hook, the Town of Red Hook, the 10% Challenge uh, slash Red Hook Conserv Conservation Advisory Council, uh, and the BARD Center for Civic Engagement. This is part of uh, the day of engagement uh, that Bard is a part of every year. Uh, and if you could please bring a non-perishable food item for Red Hook families in need. Moving Did you on. say that again? I like that. All of that? No, just that last sentence. There. Oh, please bring a non-perishable food item for Red Hook families in need. Is that it? Or do you want me to do the whole spiel again? No, 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 no. All right. It's okay. The library. Uh, they shared 5,490 items in December. Um, that was up 2% from last year at the same time. Uh, they also are participating in the Engage Red Hook um, event uh, on January 18th in conjunction with Bard. Uh, they're having a clue-style mystery event, I guess, for uh, elementary school children uh, from 1 to 3. And that night they are having Bollywood night at the Red Hook Firehouse uh, at 6.30. You can get hennaed and do some dancing, so expect to see you there. Uh, that's that. Uh, and then Bill Robinson will be doing two wildlife shows. Um, the first, 6.30, this Friday, January 17th at the Firehouse, and the second will be 6.30 Friday, February 21st, also at the Firehouse. Okay, events. Um, we had Winterfest. Uh, the first one I already reported on. The second one was snowed out. Um, so we're kind of in a little bit of a lull with events, but that doesn't mean we're not thinking about them. Um, we're always looking for new blood, new ideas, so if anyone has any um, or is interested in helping out, you may contact myself um, through the Village Hall. I'd love to meet with you and, and brainstorm and see what we got going. Um, we don't have any events going on, but there's lots of stuff to do, so now I'm going to turn it to the Julie McCoy of Red Hook and tell you everything that's going on. Um, the Red Hook CAN, the Red Hook Community Arts Network, uh, this is their workshop month, and this is their calendar, and they have something going on every single day. Um, and some of these are free, some of these are very, very low cost. Um, goes for memoir, wrote, uh, memoir writing, Photoshop, um, business practices, um, all sorts of stuff all the time. For more information, it's redhookcan.com, just R-H-C-A-N. Uh, dot com. So check that out. Uh, tomorrow evening, uh, January 14th, uh, Tuesday, January 14th at 7 p.m. in the high school cafeteria is the State of the Schools. It's the annual report um, by the superintendent. Um, just a brief update from the school leaders, followed by a Q&A, uh, just to fill people in on pertinent issues um, around the school life. Um, 
Friday, January 24th at 7 p.m. at the Tivoli Free Library, um, Red Hook Village resident Seth Kramer um, will be screening and discussing his movie, Evocateur, the Morton Downey Jr. movie. Um, this has been on numerous national lists of the top 10 best documentaries of last year. So he's going to do a free screening and Q&A Friday, January 24th at 7 p.m. In the library up there? In the library. Um, free event. I've seen this movie a couple times. It's fabulous. Oh, yeah. um, and last but not least, uh, a fundraiser for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society will be Saturday, February 8th from 6 to 8 at the Firehouse. It's called The Snowball. Uh, it's a night of dancing, silent auctions, food and fun to benefit the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. For more information, email llssnowball at gmail.com. And that's all I have. You're going to have one request? Yes. This, uh, Landscape. This document that yes. you put together here for the uh, recyclables and everything yeah. on the back, that when you start doing printing next month, that you keep 2013 there and add 2014. Sure. Thank you, Jen. That leads us to Deputy Mayor Kowalczyk for his litany of reports. Mm -hmm. Again, I uh, start with the Village Green Committee. Um, this is the December monthly report. Current balances of the Village Green Committee's related budget counts are as follows Community Beautification. We have $2,872.30, Shade Tree Contractual. $4,280 under Village Green Checking Account, $3,410.41. Um, there were no Village Green Committee meetings held during the month of December. And bench plaques, Village residents can purchase a dedication plaque that says, in honor of the memory of, dedicated by a center for $125. Proceeds <coughs> for the sale of the plaques will be deposited in the dedicated Village Green Checking Account and used to pay for the cost and installation of the plaques and Red Hook Village Community Enhancement Projects. 15 of the 15 plaques, we have 23 benches, we had 23 benches available, have been purchased today. Anyone interested can contact the village clerk's office at 758-1081. <clears throat> village Highway Department, village's snow ordinance is currently in effect until March 31st. No parking is permitted on streets from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. Vehicles parked on those streets will be towed before, during, and after snow or ice storm to facilitate snow removal. And costs for towing and vehicle storage will be charged to the vehicle's owner. And residents are reminded to remove, if they haven't already, basketball hoops, sports equipment, and other equipment from the sides of the streets to allow for snow plowing and storage. The village will not be responsible for damaged equipment remaining on or near the streets during the plowing season. And the owner or occupant of every building lot in the village with an adjoining sidewalk is required to move all snow and ice within 24 hours after an ice storm or snowstorm. At the discretion of the village board of trustees, the village highway department will remove the snow left uncleared on sidewalks after 24 hours of a storm at a cost of $20 per linear foot most cost effective to do it yourself. Uh, this cost will be assessed and collected with the next tax levy. And Christmas trees uh, began being collected on January 6th, and this service will continue through January 31st. Uh, residents are reminded to place discarded trees securely curbside for removal. Uh, as Ed was mentioning earlier, snow was removed in the general business district on December 16th. The village highway department was assisted by Frank Bosberg, excavating and paving contractor Dave Bosberg, Fast Tracks excavating Edward Stickholm, and J.S. Agnes, excavating contractor. And this cost we have budgeted for will be deducted from the uh, snow removal contractual expense account. And scrap metal was sold on November 26th and on December 17th. A revenue received by these sales totaled $904.64. Total revenue generated to date for this fiscal year is $4,688.28. Uh, 
since the inception of the scrap metal recycling program in September of 2007, $16,578.17 has been generated. Proceeds for this program go toward purchasing tools and equipment for the Village Highway Department. Anyone, businesses, or residents uh, interested in donating scrap metal can contact the Highway Department at 758-8600 or the Village Clerk at 758-1081. And the Highway Department will assist property owners by picking up scrap metal upon request. We've done pretty good this year in the scrap metal. We were expecting about $2,500. We're halfway through the year, we almost doubled it. No, that's very good. Yeah, it's been a good year. Uh, the Red Hook, Red Hook Infrastructure and Intermunicipal Task Force Monthly Report <coughs> on the sewer project. Notification was forwarded that a $30,000 New York State <coughs> excuse me, Department of Environmental Conservation and Environmental Facilities Corporation Waste Water Infrastructure Engineering Planning Grant was awarded to the Village of Red Hook. The grant will be used to continue the surface subsurface water quality study and to prepare an engineer's report. The water quality study and engineer's report, once completed, will be submitted for scoring and inclusion on the EFC intended use plan. Placement on the IUP determines priority status and eligibility for municipal sewer districts and systems capital funding opportunities. And work will begin once this formal grant and award contracts are received and signed. I know we sent some notifications at EFC today or yesterday. Yeah, I just want to interrupt you. Yes, I, when we got the, not the formal notification, they asked for a contact person, so we gave them your info. So they're supposed to send a contract with that? or? That, that's this request just said, please, within two weeks, advise if we're going to exercise it. And, we, and they gave us an email address, which we sent out today. Okay. So this is the first step in a long, long process again. The Red Hook Water Project, a lot has been discussed about that. Um, a meeting was held on December 18th at the Red Hook Village Building to review the progress, sign and submit reimbursement requests, and review the status of Phase 1 of the Red Hook Village Wellfield Improvement and Water Replacement Meter Replacement Project. Um, I think our more or less review this, this meeting was um, attended by representatives from USDA, CP Mail, and the Village of Red Hook. I did not usually go to these things. Phase two of the Red Hook Project Distribution System Improvement Project was also discussed. Um, we submitted a bunch of forms, Form A, Form B, current fact sheet, the AUD, the Form 1780-22 and Civil Rights Impact Statement, and those are all submitted to USDA. And USDA will issue a new preliminary funding estimate considering these form submissions. But we should probably get an update on that on Wednesday or next week. Um, Robert and Ed had mentioned the 2013, 2012-13 Community Development Block Grant for Wells 5 and 6 and also the 2013-14 Community Development Block Grant, which was denied. Uh, the task force met on December 6th, status updates from the historic, from historic Red Hook, formerly Egbert Benson Historical Society in Prince of Elmendorf. Um, they're, they're doing the historic structures and contributing historic features survey. The results of this survey will be integrated as an amendment to the historic preservation and demolition provisions of the Town of Red Hook zoning law. The task force also met with Ken Stores and Mark Kleminski on December 6th to review um, possible expansion of the Rec Park swimming pool and facilities. And they were discussing, we were discussing amending the current zoning provision of this site that would allow for more accessible building area to accommodate the pro proposed expansion. Uh, the task force met on December 20th. Uh, the Village of Red Hooks Infrastructure Projects, Status Update from Historic Red Hooks Survey of Historic Structures, and the Proposed Historic Preservation and Demolition Provisions, specific to the Certificate of Appropriateness requirements were also discussed. And there were no, no task force meetings held on December 27th. And various other committees, Red Hook Town Economic Development Committee, um, both Ed and I are I believe our liaisons are invited guests there. An EDC meeting was held on December 4th at the Red Village Building and the Community Preser Preservation Fund enabling legislation 
was discussed and the, and the enforcement of the two-hour parking restrictions in the village were also discussed. Um, there were no meetings of the Community Preservation Fund and Farmland Protection Advisory Committee, which I'm a member of, um, the Red of Town Zoning Review Committee, I'm a member on that. We met on December 12th and discussed locations and zoning requirements for bus shelters um, in the town. It was suggested and determined by the Red Hook Town ZEO that bus shelters must receive site plan approval by the Red Hook Town Planning Board. And the Air Attorney um, mentioned that a bus shelter is considered an, an accessory use to a principal use by the standards of the Town of Red Hook Zoning Law. And we discussed fence provisions, we reviewed the Ag and Open Space Committee's proposed definition of an agricultural fence and permitted use of this type of fence in all zoning districts of the Town of Red Hook. Uh, the Red Hook Shared Services Committee, both Ed and I sit on that with uh, officials from the town of Red Hook and the village of Tivoli. And a meeting was held on December 3rd to review and revise the draft of their request for proposals for a professional consultant to study shared highway department services for the town and the two villages. The town board approved the shared services RFP on December 10th, and the RFP was issued on December 13th. Uh, proposals were already submitted and currently being reviewed. They were submitted on January 6th and we anticipate awarding the contract on January 31st. So actually we have a meeting Wednesday before USDA hmm. to give our recommendations. Uh, Red Hook Together, there were no meetings of Red Hook Together held during the month of December and that is all I have. Thank you, Brett. <coughs> Brett, excuse me. Sure. On your uh, ZRC, mm -hmm. on the fence provisions, yep. what's their definition of a ag fence? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but um, it's to hold back livestock and um, produced agricultural produced lands, you know, the grow produce on our, our vegetables and that kind of thing. So the, the discussion centered around that these fences would be permitted in residential zones around the garden. So we also part of that provision had to do with deer fencing. And so this is something that is currently under discussion with the ERC. Okay. Thank you. Brent, maybe you could talk more about um, the shared services paragraph B there. What we have are four entities, consulting entities that responded to the RFP. Um, they range from CREO, which is a SUNY New Paltz based think tank. They did something with Northern Duchess Alliance what, two, a year ago or so. And there's um, the LaBerge Group, it's an engineering company out of the Albany area. Uh, and there's Barton and LeJudis, they're also up in the Capital District, an engineering type firm. And then a company, they, well, go, on, they, go, they go by Rondout, it's some combination of Fairweather Consulting and Rondout Consulting for the Kingston area. So that was the four, so we're reading through them. This is the money funded by the County of Dutchess, it was about $79,000 roughly to study and model shared highway services, at what level, at what point do we merge further or not further, what, what's, how do we best design something so we're not duplicating services or and, and we'll work. work. And our perspective and our argument from the village board level is we're very interested but we want to maintain services for village folks. Town folks don't get the same services that our highway department provides so that's in our equation and that does be brought up those meetings. It's, it's nothing in the end, this board gets to vote on and look at proposals right now. We're just looking at who's most affordable and who's the best consultant for it and uh, within the framework of the grant. It's actually pretty exciting and uh, we're on a pretty good timeline, I think, to get it looked at. With that, I think um, I want to jump into executive, but we'll do public comment first. Um, executive would be for um, some real estate discussion, and then um, I'll ask for motions on that in a moment. But um, 
the real estate and then also on uh, public safety. Uh, won't be long. What we try to do is get the public to give comment and then um, if we depart for a moment to executive, we'll come back quickly. We don't take any votes or anything in there, but um, I just want to update the board on a few things. Anyway, before we go off to the public, any other general business from the board members that you didn't touch on? Out to the floor. Anything out there? Mr. George. Uh, question on the water bill. Mm -hmm. Now that we have gallons, mm -hmm. do we know where missing water is yet? Or how much is missing? Well, yes and no. We, we um, at the last quarter, one of my first tasks was to look at the gross sold versus the gross pumped. Mm -hmm. And it's still not that good. We've closed the gap by probably 10 or 15%. Um, but we'll put Steve on it too. What's intriguing and ironic to me is it didn't close tighter. And when you heard one of the reports earlier, um, I think it was Steve when he was reading his, there was a pretty major leak found on West Market Street. And I'm a little befuddled because if you recall about two months ago, or maybe more than that now, we read some reports where part of the project involved an outside firm listening and they, they used equipment to look for leaks. And as I recall, I found some minor things at two or three hydrants, which we worked on. Um, not enough to make that gap still exist like it exists. But then when our highway guys opened the West Market Street problem, Dan's comment was, Ed, you were losing thousands of gallons a day out of this thing. It was that big. And, uh, well, and what has been running down underneath there at night? Listen to the, the water running through the uh, drains. You can hear it. It's been gone yeah, for years. This, this I don't was that's related to it or not. Yeah, this was further out, but I know. Yeah, I know you're talking. Come downhill. And then the other thing we had was on Tower, Tower, the Tower Market. I think it's Mark. Mark um, about three weeks ago, there was a break there that was in. It was kind of scary. I think we might have reported on that at the last meeting. Though it was, um, it was in one of the mains, not just the service line. It was the biggest, big stuff and. Uh, and that was running for a while. So um, it is still problematic. But what I asked the engineer to do is look at the metering at the wellheads and just calibrate that to tell us better. You know, we, we've always used that number. And um, it's a sophisticated measuring system over there, but they could somehow troubleshoot or double check that over there. But it is something we're still looking at. and and. It's intriguing enough to me, I don't know, you know, the end of phase one is coming to fruition here, but we've also got our water department looking at, is there some meter somewhere that didn't get changed? In other words, we're actually in similar to this backflow cross connection issue. Can we go to some of the higher consumption places and just be totally sure of what's going on? Um, okay. But anyway, we've asked the engineers to look at double checking over there at those meters and is there some way they can do a micro or mini test on site over there at the pumping stations just to double check. Um, but it is something we're looking at. So um, I know you're going to be doing reevaluating and setting the fee. Yeah. Is it going to be based on the pumped amount or the sold amount? So consume that year at the private residence. It would be um, we of course gross up the costs, meaning power, maintenance, right. all those things. And then, but then set the rate based on what you use at your house versus his house versus my house. But and then um, have they converted the, the average the, the minimum amount of water? Can you say that again. I'm sorry. There's a minimum amount which is like probably yeah. sixty dollars, and it goes up. They should go up higher. <clears throat> is what is the low? What is the lower amount? The lowest, the minimum in gallons. Do we yeah. have a number for that yet? Yeah, we just took. The old cubic foot minimum was 750 cubic feet. We just converted that. I think it's 5,610 gallons is what it converts up to. So it's the same minimum rate for now, 5,610 gallons, if that's what your question is. Okay, my question then would be, you have, you, you, I think you were trying to come up with a rate for, for elderly people or people with less income and stuff like that. In theory, they would use less water. So would it be just simpler to lower the amount like down to 4,000 gallons as a minimum rate? Well, it's a good suggestion. That's what with this rate study we would do is look at. Have two, two person, one person household, just to get a number. 
this would also help you tell when something is jumping out of you know, yeah. where it should be. It's not where in that general area. Yeah, okay. that's a good thought because I don't know how or when this 750 cubic feet became the base number. It's, um, but that would be what this, pardon me? It goes way back. Okay. It would sound like it's historic for some reason. But, <laughs> but that's what we look at. What's, what is the new base rate and then what do you, you know, base consumption and what do we need to get dollar wise? Um, another question, I, I know you had the public meeting before on the zoning and the laws that I had like seven minutes to go through. Um, I don't know if you want to address anything now or should I wait to attend the, uh, your uh, meeting to go over some of the you know, definitions and things like that? Well, I don't know. Do you have a specific couple of questions? Yeah, like three areas I'm just looking at and maybe among yourselves. Yeah. Under the charging system for EV. Mm -hmm. I mean, find you old windmills a couple of years ago and keep up with things. Um, it doesn't say whether there's a fee or no fee on, on, these, on these charging yeah, we, systems. We actually talked about that quite a bit, and we did some research. Uh, what we found is the goal would be that the, the owner of the property doesn't really even get involved in funding it, so to speak. Our understanding is there are outside companies now that charge you if you've got the cards to be charged and you set up a charging station at a commercial location. So it's, it would be a matter of designating spaces and then enabling wiring to be present. But then just how this outside entity works with the other entity. We're, we want to promote it, but they would work out the details. Uh, I know you want to promote it because it comes an unfunded mandate from the village. I mean, we're tired of them from the town and the city and the state and the governments and everybody else. But you're telling somebody who's got that many uh, minimum of 40, they have to have two spots which they lose for parking because you, does, you say in here it's for that only, just like handicapped spaces. So you no, take actually, two spaces away. We don't believe in unfunded mandates. What we did, we actually, if you read further, it might be somewhere else. We gave them a credit. We, we don't think the, um, the consensus was that some of our parking regulations demand too much parking on these bulk measurements. So if, as I recall in there, it's, it gives the five or ten percent. If you put two EVs, you get to decrease your parking by I think it was ten percent. It says lots of forty more spaces. Um, parking two EVs parking stage charging station for customer use shall be provided. In parking lots of forty or more parking spaces. So I mean, it's two spots. You're de designating; they have to have it. Yeah. And I'm also you, looking at the liability. I don't think you can jump to unfunded mandate or liability because it's um. These are for-profit scenarios, that, as we understand it. A private company comes in and says to the landowner, hey, we want to manage and run. So you would, if you're parked there, you would slide your credit card or something, and they would say, hey, it costs you $4.80 when you, you know, whatever, and you're getting your car charged. And as I understand it, it helps create a network of charging stations, which is what we want to promote. So, I don't think it's the village's position, but it's about 20 minutes to charge a car if you had it. I don't, I don't have mm -hmm. any electric cars in the area, but I think mm -hmm. taking two spots away from somebody with no, the parking but, situation. But you, you didn't hear me. We're, we're, we're actually letting them have less parking places if they do this. Yeah. I'll reread that. I don't see it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I had, it was a question about parking on the side. I know you're going round and round with that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, are you going to grandfather in existing businesses that have parking in the front there on the side? There's probably a couple of dozen in the village like that already, including the schools. Technically, they're in front. Um, if something changes, if the business changes, there's a vacant shop across from the pond. Uh, we just got parking in the front. You can't put it in the back. Mm -hmm. There's no side. If somebody opens that place up, are they going to be under new zoning that says they can't have parking in the front? I know it's well, sort of trying to think of, I'm trying to think of an example. A site plan application assumes construction or some sort of constructive change in 90% of cases or maybe 100% of cases. So it wouldn't be affecting somebody who's not changing anything. But if you're. So the old um, existing uh, um, CVS, somebody else takes that, parking currently is in the front. If they put a new building up, you make them move it to the back. But if it's an existing renovation of the building, that parking would still stay in front. 
because you have got quite a few, even the post office got parking in the back. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many businesses that have parking, the business park, they got parking in the side, in the back, in the front. And if you go through this town, I think, I think they're barking up the wrong tree on that, you know, as far as what you can do with that. And you're, they're, they refer to as yard for some reason in here, with parking. And it really, it's not a yard in a commercial lot. That's you based know, on, on the zoning map. It's a front yard, side yard. Well, that's the definition of the zoning map. Okay. There's a, actually one of the diagrams, probably the only diagram that's stained, and from all the diagrams there, clips, clearly spells what that is in, in a diagram. Front yard, rear yard, side yard. I think, George, what I would offer you is, we've given a lot of thought to it, and. I think you might be reading a little more negative into it than is there. Have to deal with it. We would sit with you. you know, <laughs> I'd be willing to sit with you and explain. It, so. Sure. I just yeah. wanted to go into the things I, just, I yeah. picked up on. So. But, um, but yeah, it would be, we don't envision forcing the property owner to pay. The, the, the market for electronic charging stations is this outside vendors come in and set it up. And, it was ironic, but I think the day after we were talking about the option, the New York Times ran a big story about it and talked about the market and what's out there. And it kind of goes with what your car is, will they survive or not, and you need these networks of charging. But anyway, but we would sit with you separately, George. Okay. Anything else? I would move then that we jump into executive session, like I said, for real estate discussion and then for uh, public safety. We could retreat and come back and very few minutes on this, and then Second. we'll. Okay. Aye. All favor. Aye. Second. 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 All favor. Aye. 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 Okay. And I would say we need a motion to pay bills after audit. Second. All favor. Aye. And then Mr. Kowalczyk, are you ready? To yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn this evening's meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So we'll see you all on Thursday. That was just efficient.